Arratxalde hon guzti hoi, eh, namaste, bandana siwa. Welcome to our small and beautiful country, Euskal Herria. Muchísimas gracias por estar con nosotros compartiendo tu experiencia vital y tu amplia sabiduría eh, en, este, en, en esta feria de Bioterra, en esta ciudad de Irún. Y, bueno, pues en nombre de todos los aquí presentes, darte la bienvenida. Welcome, eh, Ongi Etorria, Gure Herrida. Eh, quisiera comenzar mi presentación de la doctora Bandana Shiva con unas palabras suyas eh, que he encontrado eh, preparando estos días mi presentación, con las que me identifico plenamente y que considero un mensaje poderoso en estos tiempos de desorientación de valores, de crisis económica y social y de grave desestabilización ambiental. Ella nos ha dejado escrito frases como la siguiente. Life is not about making money, it's about protecting the earth. Getting money out of life and ensuring that in the way you live your life, you are personally responsible for reducing environmental pressure. En nombre de Bandana Shiva, perdón, el nombre de Bandana Shiva convoca una constelación de poderosos y sugerentes valores. Primero, compromiso. Compromiso hacia los más desfavorecidos, hacia las futuras generaciones hacia otras formas de vida que comparten con nosotros la vida en este hermoso planeta. Segundo, preservación de la biodiversidad. Es legendaria su lucha infatigable por preservar la riqueza natural de la vida, especialmente el derecho de los campesinos humildes a seguir utilizando las semillas que desde generaciones incontables han sido utilizadas en India y en otras partes del mundo, evitando su apropiación por parte de las grandes corporaciones agroalimentarias vía establecimiento de patentes. Tres, agricultura orgánica. Cuatro, protección de los recursos naturales. Cinco, democracia de la tierra. Seis, ecofeminismo. Siete, animal rights, derechos de los animales, etcétera, etcétera, etcétera. Bandana Shiva viene de India, la tierra de Mahama Gandhi y Gautama el Buda. Quizás por ello es una persona que ha encontrado la fuente profunda de su inspiración y compromiso en la conciencia del carácter sagrado de la vida, en su comprensión de que es nuestra obligación como seres humanos preservar, cuidar, proteger el más maravilloso de todos los tesoros, el tesoro de la vida del que nosotros formamos parte. Bandana Shiva estudió física, obtuvo su tesis doctoral en filosofía de la ciencia. Sin duda, podría haber tenido un futuro tranquilo y brillante como investigadora y científica bien en su país o en algún país de Occidente. Pero la llamada de aquellos árboles a los que se abrazaba con sus compañeros del legendario Chipko Movement para que no cayesen derribados por las máquinas de las compañías madereras orientó ya en los años 70 su vida hacia la defensa de la vida, de la tierra, de los agricultores humildes, de las plantas, de los animales. Para ello, entre otras muchas cosas, puso en marcha el movimiento social Nabdania para la protección de la biodiversidad y los derechos de los agricultores de la India. Una vida, pues, de compromiso que hizo que en 1993 recibiese el prestigioso galardón 
conocido como el Nobel Alternativo de Right Livelihood Award, impartido por el Parlamento de Suecia y, como se puede leer en la página web de este importantísimo galardón, For Placing Women and Ecology at the Heart of Modern Development of Discourse, por situar a las mujeres y a la ecología en el corazón del moderno discurso del desarrollo. Bandana ha desplegado los últimos 30 años una enorme energía vital que le ha llevado a poner en marcha movimientos sociales, a ser una activista internacionalmente reconocida a favor de las mencionadas causas, a investigar y escribir numerosos libros, a desarrollar una incansable labor de comunicadora y divulgadora, agitadora de las conciencias, viajando a lo largo y ancho del mundo con su poderoso grito de afirmación de la vida. Dear Bandana Shiva, thanks for being as you are. Gracias por tu testimonio vital, por tu compromiso. Para todos nosotros es un honor tenerte aquí. Tú ya es la palabra. Gracias. Thank you very much for that very generous introduction. And coming to this tiny place is part of my love for tiny things. Because I believe it's the small that creates hope. It's the large and the big that has created the destruction, that has created the despair, and that has created the crisis which we collectively face as humanity. I don't think there's any crisis left to be created. <laughs> you know? We have a massive economic crisis. This grand image of limitless financial growth, of money making, money making, money, it burst last September. Um, there's a limit to how much you can live in a fictitious world. That economy of global finance was 70 times bigger than the economy of real goods and services. And money is supposed to command real resources. It's merely a promise to say, I give you this much, and that has access to so much resources. But if the money in the world becomes 70 times more than the resources in the world, then an inevitable consequence is first, those who control that money will steal the resources of the poor, and at the end of it, their own game will come tumbling, just as much as Humpty Dumpty, who sat on a wall, and Humpty Dumpty had a great fall, and all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again, Now, all the king's men are trying very hard to give bailouts to banks, to General Motors, and it's not working because you cannot rebuild a fictitious world. Another cr crisis, of course, is the ecological crisis, also linked to two problems that's intrinsic to the current way the economy is organized. The first is that you basically have more finance than resources in the world, and you are promoting more use of those resources than the earth can sustain. So you will pump more carbon dioxide in the, into the air, and thank goodness there are people like you to create some level of solution. But the second very, very deep issue is the separation of the economy from ecology. Both economy and ecology have the same roots. 
and the roots are house, household. Ecology is supposed to be the science of the household and economy is supposed to be the management of the household. And right now the management has worked against the science of the household and it has worked against the householders. It's worst worked against those who have cared, um, against the women, against the small peasant, against the small producer, against the protectors, as you said, of the soil and the seed and the water and the air. And of course, you have a food crisis. L last year was the year the world woke up to it with 40 countries having food riots. And the food crisis has many faces. One face is the starving child. And Africa used to be the face of the starving child. But within the last 15 years of the globalized economy, India has become the country with the largest number of hungry children. A quarter of the world's hungry people are now in India. And we have, in the search for high economic growth, we have beaten Africa in creating hunger. But there are other aspects to the food crisis. I believe one of those aspects of the food crisis are the new diseases related to industrial food, to eating things that were never meant to be eaten. The global food industry is making trillions out of feeding us artificial food, synthetic food, false food, and creating the diseases of obesity, of diabetes, of uh, in children, attention deficit disorder. You look at all the diseases of the world that are called lifestyle diseases, they're actually, they should be called food industry diseases. They've been created by the food industry. I also see the monopoly on the food supply as part of the food crisis. If five companies of the world control the seed, and if five companies control the trade in food, and five country, companies control the processing of food, that is not democracy because every one of us is capable of producing food. Every one of us is capable of processing food. You don't need a Nestle to give us our daily noodles. And I get depressed when I come to Europe, and no matter where I am, there's only Dan Danone or Danone? How do you pronounce it? Danone. Danone. Only Danone with synthetic yogurt. You know, we set yogurt in our kitchens every day. It's totally doable. I even used to make my own yogurt when I studied in North America. You don't need a company as big as Danone to make your daily yogurt. You don't need a company like Monsanto to provide seeds to the world. In any case, they're not improving seeds. They're destroying seeds. This, the word for seed in India is bija. Bija means that from which life arises and renews itself forever on its own. You have a seed, you sow it next year, and for thousands of years, that same seed can give you food. That's how farmers have bred their seed. When, when we sow the seed, we have so many ceremonies and a common prayer across India that peasants will say is, may the seed be exhaustless. You 
let it constantly renew itself. Now, the giant companies found that a problem. The renewal of seed is the renewal of life. And therefore, they had to stop seed from renewing itself. And there are three instruments they created to do that. The first instrument was legal, and that is called patenting. If you have a patent on something, you can prevent anyone else from having that patented product. But seed is not an invention. And a patent on seed is totally illegitimate. Seed has been created by evolution and improved by farmers. It is the common heritage of communities, countries, and humanity. The second way in which seed has been made non-renewable is biological. And, and for this, mainly the hybrid seeds are created which do not breed true, so farmers must go buy seed every year. But the worst is genetically engineered terminator seed designed to create sterile seed. At the time when the embryo in the seed is forming, the genetic engineering releases a to lethal toxin that kills the embryo. So a farmer can grow a crop and never sow that crop again for next year's seed. I personally believe this is a crime against nature. It's a crime against farmers. We are at BioTerra, and most of you who are aware of good eating know that germinated food is very healthy. Can you imagine the value of food if it cannot germinate? If you can take alpha alpha and it'll never germinate, you can take moong dal and it'll never germinate. Food, if seed is dead, food is dead. And of course, an economy that has given us so much violence against nature and so much violence against people will create a political crisis, it'll create an econom uh, a social crisis, it'll create a cultural crisis. The political crisis is quite evident. I know today is European elections. And I was reading in the newspaper on my travel over yesterday that um, 20 years ago, two-thirds of Europe used to vote for European elections. And this election, only one-third of Europeans will vote, which means people will get elected without real representation. In India, we've had new elections. We've had the government brought back to power on the basis of 15% vote. So we have a huge political crisis that representative democracy has stopped being representative. It has stopped being democratic. It has stopped being democratic because instead of being by the people, of the people, for the people, it has become by the corporations, of the corporations, for the corporations. And quite clearly, just as the financial bubble burst, this political bubble will burst in the next few years. And we as citizens need to be fully aware that we have to be already sowing the seeds of another way of organizing ourselves politically so that the decisions that we want made have a way of coming into being. There's a social crisis related to this dis dis disenchantment. 
There's a cultural crisis related to it. And very often the growth of terrorism, of extremism, of religious fundamentalism are treated as disconnected from all these processes. But they have a very deep connection. In 1984, I wrote a book that connected the violence of Punjab that killed 30,000 people to the Green Revolution. Now, all the popular narrative was this was about religious conflict. There was no religious conflict in Punjab. But there was a conflict over rivers. There was a conflict over the price of grain. There was a conflict over the dying soils. And basically, what's emerged as religious, what emerged as extremism was the discontent, really, of the farmers. And it was mutated into a religious uh, conflict. If you look around the world, so much of what is today called conflict between cultures, which Samuel Huntington famously called the clash of civilizations, is actually conflicts over resources, conflicts over development models, conflicts over having your fair share in production. Even Darfur is not about Christians and Muslims. It's about declining resources and a destroyed agriculture. And if we do not take care, then every area of the world will you know, become like we have watched the Swat Valley in Pakistan. Or the Tamil Tigers of Sri Lanka. Or even the Rwandan genocide had its roots in economic systems. And all these crises that seem to be different crises have one root. And that common root is that we are now living on the planet as if we were not part of the biosphere. As if we are not part of an earth family. And that's why we must move beyond failed economies, failed politics, failed social cultural models to living systems. The globalization model that till last year was presented to us as something which had no alternative. Tony Blair had said it. Bill Clinton had said it. They had said there is no alternative to globalization. This is the only system. And we'd had a brilliant American who even wrote a book called The End of History. After 1989, when the Berlin Wall collapsed, he said, now there's an end to history. From now onwards, markets will rule. Well, the markets aren't able to hold themselves up anymore. How can they rule? But the global markets that was packaged into the word globalization made a lot number of shifts. The first shift was it shifted us from being members of the earth community to being shoppers in a global supermarket. It transformed ecosystems, species, biodiversity into being mere commodities to be bought and sold and traded. It transformed what was common to all life, the air, the water, the biodiversity, into private property. And for this, they even crafted an international agreement which has a very big, complicated name. And, you know, every time something is devious is done, they need to create very complicated names. <coughs> 
The name of this treaty, which is meant to privately own life on Earth, is called the Trade Related Intellectual Property Rights Agreement of the World Trade Organization. <laughs> They should have written one line, the treaty to allow Monsanto to own life on earth. Because Monsanto has gone on record to say in writing this agreement, they were the patient, the diagnostician, and the, and, uh, the physician all in one. They identified the problem and the problem was that farmers save seeds. And they found a solution. And the solution was that farmers should be made criminals for saving seeds. But that is criminalizing our highest duty to the earth. And it's criminalizing our highest duty to future generations. Because every society has said you must save seed. To allow seed to be destroyed is equal to genocide. In the mountain areas in the Himalaya where I come from, in, you know, in the 19th century, the British had been involved in a battle in that area. <laughs> And they found that people had died of hunger, but they had not touched the seed baskets. The seed baskets were full, but people had died of hunger. Because for the future, they had to leave the seed. And that is why when I first came across this agreement of seed patenting in 1987, that's when I decided I would start saving seeds. And I would fight every law that makes it illegal to save seeds. And as you mentioned, I've drawn a lot of inspiration from Gandhi. Both in saving seeds. Because, you know, when the British ruled us and they were refusing to go, Gandhi pulled out a little spinning wheel. And he asked every Indian to spin. And when people said, how do you think you can deal with the cannonballs of the empire through little pieces of wood held together? And he said, it's precisely because the spinning wheel is so small that it can be in the hands of the poorest woman and be operated in the smallest hut. That is why it is powerful, because millions can participate in freedom. And I took inspiration from that and made the seed the spinning wheel of today. That to the extent we have our seed, we save our seed. To that extent, we can say no to the Monsanto empire of patents on life, GMOs, and the criminalization of farmers. The second inspiration we have taken from Gandhi is the inspiration to be able to say no to unjust law. It's a hundred years this year when Gandhi first practiced what he called the fight for truth, Satya Gre. Satya as truth, Agra as the fight. Fighting against false law, unjust law, according to him, was an ethical duty. And in South Africa, he fought against apartheid based on race. He and other Indians refused to wear the identity tags according to race. They said, we are one people. We will not be divided according to race. And then when he came back to India to fight for India's freedom, he practiced many satyagrahs. Two of the most powerful 
were one was when the British used to force us to grow indigo for dye. And the farmers, peasants who grew it were starving. They were not allowed to grow food. Every inch had to grow indigo. And Gandhi started a non-cooperation and said, we will no more grow indigo. We will grow our own food. Another you might be much more popular, or much more aware of, was the salt satyagraha. When the British, to make more money, to buy more weapons, to shoot more Indians, said, we will monopolize the salt. And in the tropics, you need a lot of salt because you lose a lot of salt. So salt is vital to our life. And when the British made the salt laws, Gandhi walked to the beach, picked up the salt and on the sea, and said, nature gives it for free. We need it for our survival. We will continue to make our salt. We are forced to disobey your salt laws. And we've taken inspiration from that to do what we call Bij Satyagraha, the seed Satyagraha. Every time the government tries to bring a law that makes it illegal for farmers to save seeds, we mobilize across the country and tell the government that just like Gandhi said, salt is our birthright, seed is our birthright. And we will continue to save our seeds and share our seeds and we will never allow this to be turned into a criminal act. And I'm happy to say three times over we have blocked government laws that would have made it illegal for farmers to have their own seed. And we'll continue to do this as long as it is required. I hope it will not be required for too long and that it will be recognized that the crime is not of the farmer who saves seed. The crime is of the corporations with exterminate seed and the farmer too. Because seed monopolies, you know, might not show too much at the level of the consumer. Though if, if you're sensitive to taste, you'll realize then, you know, the corn doesn't taste like the corn used to taste. And the bread isn't the same as the bread used to be. And definitely that soya, GMO soya cannot be like the non-GMO soya. For the farmer, the monopoly on seed has literally meant a genocide. Monsanto came into India in 1997. In the first year of their selling seeds that could not reproduce, farmers' suicide started. Since then, we have, as a movement, monitored these suicides. And according to the government's data, not just ours, since 97, there have been 200,000 farmers' suicides. Now, every farmer who's committing suicide is leaving behind a widow and children. And every farmer who's committing suicide is the most distressed face of a farming community that is in despair. And across the world, farming communities are in despair because we have a suicidal economy in place. It's a suicidal economy which makes the farmer spend more than the farmer can ever earn. In India, in the cotton area, the costs of production have gone up 10 times and the earnings of the farmers have dropped to one third. 
but it would be the same for a sheep farmer in the Basque country. It would be the same for a farmer anywhere in Europe, anywhere in America, that the costs of production are shooting up, the earnings of the farmers are dropping. And the farmers always made to feel it's their inadequacy, that it was their fault that they could not be competitive, as it, as it said. But the system is designed to destroy small farmers. And without small farmers, we cannot conserve. For me, a small farmer is not just a producer of food. The small farmer is the keeper of seed. The small farmer is the conserver of water. The small farmer who's doing ecological agriculture is a builder of soil. And I would say that the small farmers who are organic and biological are today the biggest hope for solving the climate problem. I have recently written a book called Soil Not Oil. And while writing the book, uh, my research showed that at least 40% of the problem of greenhouse gases is related to industrial globalized systems of food production. When you pump synthetic fertilizers into the soil, you pump nitrogen oxides into the air. And nitrogen oxide is 300 times more destructive of the climate than even carbon dioxide. Every time you imprison animals into factory farms of the kind that led to the swine flu from Mexico, the Smithfield plant, those factory farms are major sources of methane. You can't live next to a factory farm. It's impossible. Stink is so bad. And that stink comes from methane. And of course, with all the packaging and all the transport, you are adding a lot of carbon dioxide to the air by the use of fossil fuels. The Danish government a few years ago had, had done a study that showed that for every kilogram of unnecessary trade in food, there's 10 kilograms of CO2 emissions into the air. And that's why building economies that are local becomes a very important part. Of course, there are certain things that you can't grow locally. For example, in the Basque country, you could not grow cotton. You cannot grow the spices. Uh, you cannot grow the coffee and the tea. But these are all things that are needed in less of volume. The crazy situation is when Spain sends all of its organic produce off to somewhere else. And at breakfast, I picked up every fruit and I put it back because it was all from Chile. Why should some place so far away, beyond the Atlantic, on the Pacific, in the southernmost tip of Latin America, be the source of feeding the Basque country, which has the tremendous climate for food growing? And of course, vegetables and fruits are about the worst because they need refrigeration. They need to be flown by air. If you work out a per unit footprint of the transport of fruits and vegetables worldwide, it's much bigger than any other product. And fresh vegetables, in fact, 
Taste best, grow best locally. But the problem of the supermarket logic is it allows five companies to control a sector. Those five companies go to where they can produce most cheaply. And cheapness in the global marketplace is based on exploiting nature and exploiting labor. Exploiting nature means you grow beans and lettuce in the Rift Valley in Africa and you leave a drought for the people there. And for the people who are losing their land and their water, they will fight. That is why the tribes are killing them each other in the Rift Valley. Those ethnic conflicts of Kenya are connected to the global marketing of cheap food. And sustainable agriculture is not just a sustainability solution. It's also a peace solution. Because our challenge now is to transform this system of exploiting more resources and exploiting more of the third world into giving more to nature and giving more back to the producer. But that also means that the shift that was made of transforming us as humans from people who are producers, who have needs, into mere consumers in a global supermarket. That we must change that. One of the things I've totally enjoyed at BioTerra is watching the wonderful babies go by. But I also know that babies are a new market. From before they can walk and talk, they, t they are targeted with advertising. And the minds of our future generations are being stolen. Going beyond consumerism is, I, I believe, one of the most radic radical changes we can make. And to say, no, say no, to say no to predatory consumerism is something we don't need governments for. We can do, make those choices in our everyday lives. But the wonderful thing is the more we lower our consumption in throughput, the more we elevate our quality of life. So to consume less actually means to have a better life with higher quality. You know, I've grown up in a country where you could mend everything. And I look at today's throwaway culture and I find how wasteful it is. You know, including the fact that every time we have to drink a glass of water, I don't know how much of nature we have already exploited. And this happens because there's someone who can make money and they, they make us trade away are caring for carelessness. We have become complicit in the destruction of the planet because we've given up two values. One is the value of caring, but caring means effort. Caring means patience. Caring means having public faucets in an exhibition hall like this and making sure everyone can drink water. And, you know, we've substituted it with the... We call it convenience, but how can it be convenient if we are eating our own future? It is highly inconvenient to put your own species at risk.
So I do not call it convenience, I call it carelessness. And carelessness has become the biggest marketing strategy. Farmer is told, why do you bother to make compost, spray urea? Why do you bother with mixed cultivation, spray pesticide? Farmers are asked to be careless. We are asked to be careless. Why bother to build a local farmer's market where you know what you're buying? Go to the supermarket and buy what you don't know you're buying. You have no idea where it came from, what is in it, what will it do to your health. The second value that we have been forced to give up is the value of solidarity. Solidarity is connection, is to realize our relationship with each other. Solidarity with other species is to know our relationship with other species. Our solidarity with trees is to know that we depend on trees for the oxygen we breathe. Solidarity with the third world means recognizing we are all part of one earth family, one universal human family. We might have different colored hair and different colored eyes and different colored skin. We might speak different tongues as we are. And that does not divide us enough. It, beyond it, we are all human. And beyond that, we are all children of the earth. That is why I talk of building an earth democracy. For me, earth democracy is about transforming killing economies into living economies. The current economy is killing the earth, killing the farmers, killing our health. We could have an agriculture that protects the earth, protects the farmers, and protects our health. In fact, one of the stalls in Bioterra is of Navdanya. Navdanya is the movement I started in 87. And it means both nine seeds for diversity as well as the new gift for solidarity. And recently, once the suicides became too many, I just felt it wasn't enough to count how many farmers had died. That wasn't enough solidarity. That we had to do something to stop the suicides. So I took a pilgrimage through these suicide areas. We call them the suicide belt because they are all the BT cotton, Monsanto GM cotton area. And again and again, the farmer said, our old seed is gone. We don't have our seed. So the first thing we did was bring them seed. Seeds of freedom and seeds of hope. Seeds they could save and get out of the debt trap. We gave them training in organic farming. And out of that came this amazing organic cotton. Normally, Navdanya has worked on organic food. We haven't worked on fibers. But once the farmers had started to grow organic cotton, they wanted our help in fair trade and marketing with, at adequate prices. So we decided to go into fibers of freedom. And for us, fibers of freedom means for the farmer freedom from debt and suicide. It means freedom from GMOs. For the consumer, it means freedom from the toxic cotton that BT cotton is. But it also is freedom from being part 
of a destructive economy. It's freedom to be part of a living economy. So I do hope some of you will go down to the stall and meet my colleagues and talk to them about how we have built this Fibers of Freedom movement. If in the last 20 years, the turnout for the European elections have dro has dropped by one third, in another 10 years, no one will be going out to vote. That kind of false democracy is now a dead democracy. So in place of the killing economies, we need living economies. In, cave, in place of the dead democracy, we need living democracy. And again, it's not the case that failed leaders are going to suddenly wake up one day and say, here is how we reorganize society to be more democratic. We will have to create these ideas and these practices. The way we've been doing it in India is village by village, creating freedom zones. And in these freedom zones, the community decides how they will live in order to not destroy their natural resources. How they will protect the biodiversity, the water, the soil, and their livelihoods. And part of this has helped us create GMO-free zones in India, like there are GMO-free regions in Europe. And I know the Basque country is part of a GMO-free region. And I know the Basque country, in fact, chairs the GMO-free network of Europe. And it would be good for the Basque country to lead the rest of Spain into becoming GMO-free. We also need to create living cultures. In the last few years, we have been repeatedly taught that someone who is not exactly like us is our enemy. And Samuel Huntington, who wrote about the clash of civilizations, said something I do not understand. He said, you cannot know who you are till you know who you hate. I know who I am through whom I love. It's relationships of solidarity that define the person not non-relationships of hate and fear. And this culture of fear, this culture of hate, is also stealing our humanity. It is a troubled soul who goes to sleep afraid of all the diversity around them. Diversity is our strength. Ecologically, it is our strength at the biological level. Socially and culturally, it is our strength because it reminds us of our common humanity. We are going to face more challenges around learning how to be Earth citizens and respecting each other in spite of superficial differences. But that basically is going to be our strength now. You know, when Gandhi was building the kind of India he wanted to see, he had talked about how every person would be the center of the universe how every village would be center of the world, and how these ever-expanding but never-ascending circles 
of oceanic inclusion would create a global community built on the person, the individual, the community, the region, and the country. We need to do the same in terms of how we build our economies. Right now, as I mentioned, we have this crazy situation where the top of the pyramid has become too inflated. And it is eating into the bottom of the pyramid. It is eating into the bottom of the pyramid in terms of nature's economy. It is eating into the bo bottom of the pyramid in terms of people's economies, the people's ability to create, produce, and make things. You cannot have an upside down pyramid stable. Just as much as you cannot have buildings like this with just roofs and no walls and no foundations. both in terms of politics and in terms of economics, we are building buildings with only roofs by e pulling out the stones from the foundation. It is now in our hands to lay those building blocks of the foundation again. Some of this work is ecological. Most of this work is social. A little bit of this work will be international solidarity. But if we cannot rebuild our ecosystems and if we cannot rebuild our communities, we will not be able to build the bridge to our own future. I know we are capable of doing these small things that make a big difference. That's what I've tried to do. That's what I hope everyone will try to do. Once again, I'm very happy to be here with you at BioTerra.